We need a new system. We need a new society. We need to demand that which may have sounded impossible even a few weeks ago, but is not only realizable, but an imperative necessity. Several days ago, U.S. officials said that a negotiated ceasefire is near in Gaza. Some Israeli military forces have been pulled out of southern Gaza, but this war rages on. Welcome to The Socialist Program. I'm your host, Brian Becker. Today we're talking with Mohammed Nabulsi. He's an organizer with the Palestinian Youth Movement. He's an attorney based in Houston, Texas. Mohammed, welcome back to The Socialist Program. Thank you for having me again. Mohammed, I think the topic on everyone's mind is whether or not the war in Gaza is coming to an end. The Biden administration, various Biden administration officials say that they are taking over the negotiations, that they're insisting on a ceasefire, they're distancing themselves from uh, Netanyahu. The Israeli military did withdraw military forces from southern Gaza. Netanyahu said it was just for recuperation, that they're going to go in, they're going to launch an invasion of Rafah, no matter what. But all the indications seem to be that the U.S. is really promoting and pushing hard now for a settlement. At the same time, the Israeli military just this morning, a few hours ago, assassinated the three sons of the Hamas leader Ismail Haniya. Uh, three sons killed in a targeted assassination by the Israelis, I believe, in northern Gaza. Uh, the war is going on. It's raging on. Uh, do you expect a ceasefire? It's really difficult to say at this point. Uh, I think, as you stated, we've received so many mixed messages. I think uh, part of it is tied to attempting to place pressure on all of the parties involved by cultivating sort of uh, popular pressure, right? So once people hear these news, this news that a ceasefire is coming, it often results in it trickling up uh, that they feel it themselves. So I think that's what we're seeing. Uh, at the same time, I think the Israelis have nowhere to go. Uh, and so the ceasefire is the only thing that's on the table. But Hamas will not give in to the concessions um, that the Israelis are demanding. And that's why we're seeing different attempts to place pressure, including the assassination of Ismail Haniya's three sons and several grandchildren. This is another attempt to uh, weaken the leadership of the Palestinian resistance. But as he stated today, uh, following the assassination of his, his of his three sons and grandchildren, that this will not change the position of the Palestinian resistance on negotiations. Addition, saw um, Netanyahu announced after Ben Gavir threatened to dissolve the uh, coalition following news of uh, you know a hesitancy or reluctance to go into Rafah. Um, that Netanyahu came out and said, "Well, we've set a date for our invasion, which is unusual in military." Uh, strategy, and only to see uh, uh, Anthony Blinken um, come out and say in discussions with Yoav Gallant, the defense minister, that there has been no date set. And in fact, the Americans are still no discussing this with the Israelis. And so it's clear that most of what's happening right now is political theater or pressure on negotiations. But ultimately, there's no more leverage. I think a few weeks back when I, when I was on the program with you, I discussed the attempts to deport the resistance leadership to freeze their assets. And so we're seeing all of these last ditch efforts to try to get the resistance to capitulate on some of the most important terms that are all tied to the safety and security of the people of Gaza, right? The return to the North, the withdrawal of the Israeli military, the increase in aid that, you know, in recent few days, we've seen sort of theater around as well, which we can discuss further, but that's ultimately where we are. I don't see this war ending uh, in the immediate, uh, unless the Israelis come to terms with their defeat. Mohammed, I want to pick up on the issue of defeat. You're characterizing the Israeli military move into Gaza as a setback, a military defeat. You're saying that Israel has been defeated. In some ways, that seems incongruous to, let's say, people just watching TV in the United States, people who may not be that close to what's going on in the Middle East, because on the face of it, uh, Israel and the Israeli military 
has killed tens of thousands of Palestinians, destroyed more than 60% of the houses in Gaza. Uh, there are more than a million people in Gaza who are displaced. The, the UN and now the US government says that the people in Gaza are starving or they're being starved. On the face of it, it looks like with all of this death and destruction, it would be impossible to say, well, this was a defeat for Israel. And yet many, including many inside the Israeli media, are now saying it was a defeat. Let's talk about how this could be considered a defeat for Israel in light of all of the death and destruction Im imposed by the Israeli military on the people of, pa of Palestine, the people of Gaza. So with any war, with any campaign, with any operation, there are obviously stated objectives, and those are political in nature. You're attempting to impose uh, a state of affairs politically on, a, on, a, on another people or another actor. And so for the Israelis, they, from the outset, stated what their goals were, that they would eliminate Hamas and its leadership, that would, they would completely degrade their capabilities, including the firing of rockets and their capacity to actually resist uh, Israeli occupation, and that they would uh, completely alter the condition of the Gaza Strip, where they would put the governance of the Gaza Strip either under the Israeli occupation or, or a coalitional force or something of that nature. Right. And now there was also other stated goals that we saw throughout. And I don't know that they ever unified on them because I don't believe that they were actually ever achievable revolved that revolved around completely ethnically cleansing the Gaza Strip. So those are the stated goals. And when you are the superpower, when you are the power with uh, Air Force, a Navy, an army. Uh, reserves, your entire economy is sort of geared towards prosecuting this war when you're that superior power you have to achieve your goals against a weaker, a weaker power. And in the past, we've seen the Israelis uh, defeated repeatedly in these types of wars, but their goals specifically articulated here have not even come close to being achieved. And that includes the release of the hostages. The only hostages that have been released have either been done through negotiations, there's a, a few exceptions to that, and the ones that were killed by the Israelis themselves. We also know that the Israelis have probably killed dozens if not north of 100 hostages through their bombardment and genocidal campaign. And so their inability to achieve these goals demonstrates that for the Palestinians, the weaker party, they've prevailed. Now, that doesn't in any way assuage the feeling of mourning and uh, deep dread around what has been done to our people uh, as Palestinians, what has been done to the Gaza Strip. But at the end of the day, when you fight a national liberation struggle, one in which your enemy is so superior to you militarily and backed by even a more superior superpower, both of which are nuclearly armed states, um, this is what it looks like to struggle and fight. And this is what victory means for us as a people. Mohammed, when one reads the Israeli media, you can see that there's a decidedly different orientations. Uh, the liberal Zionist media, some of which and some of the reporters and writers are in Haaretz, for instance, they've been for months indicating that this entire operation will end up in defeat or could very well end up in defeat for Israel and sacrifice Israel's reputation globally as, and, and make Israel a pariah state, basically. And that, that's true. I mean, that's already happened. I don't think that's going to change. When you think about the, the stated objectives of the Israelis, of Netanyahu, which is to completely eliminate Hamas, and then you're negotiating with Hamas, that in itself is an inherent foundational contradiction. Because if your goal is to completely destroy the other side, there's, what's the point of negotiation? So obviously, uh, in terms of the reality of the situation, they can't destroy Hamas. And according to the, to the Israeli media, and again, this is Zionist media, but liberal Zionist media, they're making the argument that Hamas's military capability has not been effectively, uh, well, it's been damaged in some ways, obviously, it's been a very gruesome war, but their capacity to fight has not been actually disrupted. In other words, they are intact. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the sort of contradiction between like liberal Zionists, labor Zionists and the right 
is a historic one around their strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. For the liberal Zionists, and at one point labor Zionists, this notion of land for peace, negotiations, understanding that the Palestinians aren't going away, but recognizing that you still want to maximize your, your sort of expansionist project, uh, required a specific strategy, and they engaged that, and they ultimately view themselves as failing in that. And for the right wing, uh, right, that's inherited the sort of Jabotinsky iron wall politics that Netanyahu himself embodies ideologically. The idea is we must bring them to their knees, the Palestinians. We must make them understand that we will devastate them beyond anything they can imagine before we grant them any sort of concessions around their nationhood, around the need for them to have self-determination, the right of return, and, and, and various other political claims that Palestinians have. Well, now we're seeing the failure of both strategies. Uh, and showing what we're seeing is the, the demonstrated resilience of the Palestinian people and the resistance project of the Palestinian people. If you can uh, look at the most recent scenes out of Khan Yunus, a battle that took place for over four months, smaller, uh, 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 one-fourth the size of the entire Gaza Strip, which was a small, densely populated area in and of itself, they left, on an, a, they left out of an ambush where... Multiple Israeli soldiers were killed, multiple above that injured, and that's how they departed Khan Yunus. And if you compare that to prior operations and initiatives, let's say the 1982 invasion of Beirut, the Israelis reached Beirut and besieged Beirut and theoretically, or, or in, in theory, I guess, defeated the Palestinian uh, PLO in three months. An area of the, of, of the Gaza Strip Tiny in comparison to Lebanon. And we've seen that routinely in other sort of arenas. The Six Day War in 1967, in which the Israelis were able to defeat multiple Arab conventional militaries in six days. Similarly, in the 1973 war, which was fought to a stalemate, lasted less than a month. So all of these prior sort of uh, demonstrations of Israeli superiority in Palestinian or Arab weakness, the Palestinian resistance has clearly transformed the political and military equation vis-a-vis -vis the Israelis. And we're seeing that now in the fact that there's still operations taking place in the north, right? They've withdrawn all battalions with the exception of one. They're still hanging on to this notion that victory comes through Rafah, even though now there's discussions about whether they even invade Rafah. So it's a resounding defeat. And the, those who predicted it on the part of the Israelis knew it because they understood what the dynamics of their actual political class looked like, their actual ability to execute. And we know what happened on October 7. This is the same military, the same intelligence agencies, the same leadership failed miserably on October 7. And so they're expected to now, with the same amount of intelligence, the same capabilities to actually defeat Hamas, which was prepared for their invasion. Obviously, that's a fantasy. But for Netanyahu and his ilk, there was no off-ramp. This was the only path forward. And now that's why we're seeing them trying to escalate with Iran, which I hope we get to discuss, as a way, another attempt to build another off-ramp for them to see if maybe they can survive this politically or declare some sort of victory. Yes, I, I, I hear you on that. And, you know, when you think about uh, wars where you have large-scale conventional militaries like the Israeli military or like the U.S. military, and you and I have talked before about Vietnam. Uh, and as a young person, I was told over and over again, we can't lose in Vietnam because, you know, some parts of the Vietnamese National Liberation Forces were actually fighting with bows and arrows. Uh, and we have, you know, B-52 bombers and 2,000-pound bombs and precision missiles and the ability to carpet bomb the Vietnamese countryside, which the U.S. did in Operation Rolling Thunder for three years straight, killing more than 1,000 civilians a week. Uh, that's 180,000 civilians in three years. That, those are the Pentagon's own estimates. And it looked like, yeah, how could the Vietnamese win? But this is an asymmetrical war, and it's also, in the case of Vietnam, the, Viet, the, the American soldier wanted to go home. The American soldier's main goal was to go home after their one-year tour in duty. And for the Vietnamese soldier, they were home. They weren't going anywhere. And as a consequence, they were prepared to fight and fight and fight and fight. So the psychology, the mentality, the spirit, 
the understanding of the war. So even though in the case of Palestine, Hamas doesn't have an army in a typical fashion, it doesn't have a navy, it doesn't have an air force, it doesn't have significant anti-aircraft capacity, and yet the, the element of the struggle that can't be sort of wished away by the Israelis is the Palestinian resistance itself. And unlike Beirut in 1982, where the Palestinians were very formidable, but they were in somebody else's country, Gaza is Palestine. Absolutely. And I think like what people don't understand, and, and this, there's been this attempt by even people who are nominally pro-Palestine, who, who attempt to sort of um, you know, sympathize with the Palestinians purely as victims, not as political or resistance actors, um, that Hamas and every single Palestinian faction fighting in Gaza is a part of the Palestinian people. It's a part of our fabric as a society and Gaza and the pa pa entire of, entirety of Palestine. And these are the sons and daughters. These are the fathers and husbands of ordinary Palestinians in Gaza. And what we've seen for the Israeli strategy, we've seen this both in the recent targeting of today of Ismail Haniyeh's three sons and grandchildren, and the reporting that we've seen in terms of the targeting of uh, Hamas fighters who even enter only when they enter homes, where they're surrounded by their family or by their friends, that this is a deliberate strategy, not to target Hamas as Hamas, but to target the Palestinian people and its surrounding of Hamas. And the fact that it is integral uh, as a faction, as an institution to Palestinian society. And so this is the war that's being waged on the Palestinian people, not on Hamas, the entirety of the Palestinian people. And, not as, and when I say not on Hamas, I mean also not on the Palestinian resistance because Hamas is not one and the same as the resistance because there are so many different factions fighting on behalf of the Palestinian people. This targeting of the Palestinian people, our civil, civilian infrastructure, our institutions, of higher learning, of religious learning, of whatever it might be, this is in a way the only strategy they have at their disposal, the only thing they can practically do because they can't confront them militarily on the ground. Hamas has developed enough capabilities and infrastructure to level aspects of the playing field, right? Israel's entire uh, military strategy in the long term is predicated on superior air force. They're, they are a military that fights from the air. So how did Hamas neutralize that threat vis-a-vis -vis their own uh, uh, abilities, their infrastructure? It's to go underground. And so what can you do then? You have to fight them on the ground and under the ground. But what we're seeing is the Israeli military, one that is typically um, used to occupying people, raiding homes where there aren't any, any armed uh, individuals, they're in, unable to fight on the ground. Lebanon showed us, showed us this in 2006 when they invaded and were uh, resoundingly defeated by the Lebanese resistance. And the latest battles that we've seen in Gaza, in every refugee camp, in every city, in every neighborhood, shows they're unable to actually meet Palestinian fighters face to face. Let's turn to the, the, the sort of last ditch effort by Netanyahu to change the equation, and you alluded to it, which was the bombing of the Iranian embassy in Syria. And the embassy was bombed by the Israelis uh, at a time when several senior, very senior Iranian military leaders were present. So Israel obviously knew they were there in the embassy and they destroyed the embassy, and they killed these top Iranian leaders. Now, you can't get more provocative than that. Um, I'm going to pull up a New York Times headline about, about this, which I think is like, it shows like what an imperialist media we have. But the Vienna Convention, Mohammed, uh, that is signed by all member nations of the United Nations, says a diplomatic compound, a diplomatic compound is inviolable. Even in wartime, you don't destroy the other countries, the enemy country's embassy, because in that case, every country's embassy would be vulnerable. So it's in the self-interest of all nations to declare, and as they did with the Vienna Convention, that diplomatic compounds can't be attacked. Now look at this headline. Uh, Israel bombed an Iranian embassy complex. Is that allowed? Question mark. 
Israel can likely argue that its actions did not violate international laws protections for diplomatic uh, missions, experts say. Well, this obviously shows the New York Times has, at best, an ambivalent attitude towards the Vienna Convention. I'm quite sure that if anybody bombed the U.S. Embassy anywhere in the world, uh, it would be understood not simply as a violation of the Vienna Convention, but an act of war where the the country that or the entity that had done that would certainly be a subject to massive retaliation. Now, uh, the article is ridiculous, by the way, just for our audience to understand why they, they say legal experts might be unsure. The Vienna Convention says that every host country has an ob has a legal obligation to make sure that about the inviolability, the the untouchability of the of the embassies of other countries, and since Israel wasn't the host country, it didn't have a legal responsibility to the Iranian embassy, and thus bombing the Iranian embassy wasn't necessarily. Uh, out of conformity with the language of the Vienna Convention. I mean, you can't get more tortured in terms of the so-called legal logic, which is not legal at all. But obviously, it's a provocation. Obviously, Netanyahu did it hoping that Iran would feel we must retaliate for the sake of our honor, our dignity, our strategic status. And then if Iran responds, let's say it hits Israel with missiles, the U.S. then comes to the defense of Israel. So far, Iran has not retaliated. Anyway, let's get, I want to get your thoughts. This was a very big event, and the, the outcome of it, the impact, the ripple effect, so to speak, that might be a too weak of a word, we haven't seen that yet. Yes, I think this is one of the most significant events that's occurred since the beginning of this war. And I think we cannot understate the move that was made by the Israelis to target an embassy. Now, I'm, I'm not here to sort of uh, affirm uh, legal, international legal norms or the, the sacred, sacredness of the international legal order, because we know that's routinely violated both by the Israelis and the Americans, uh, the American government. So it's something to which, uh, like, uh, obviously you expect certain norms to be out of bounds just for the sake of, as you stated, everyone's self-interests, right? We shouldn't do this because doing this would be a problem for all of us. Uh, that's what mutually assured nuclear destruction is meant to do as well. Uh, but apparently um, this, the Israelis feel themselves in such a desperate position that they're willing to, to go even cross, uh, to, to even cross this line. And I think your, your assessment that this is specifically a provocation by Netanyahu um, in order to sort of weasel his way out of this war I think is spot on. I think what we've seen is first the context of their inability to do anything uh, in Rafah, the sort of cooling of relationships, at least in a theoretical, uh, th theatrical form uh, between the US and the Israelis. Um, they need a way to re enlist the Americans and to agitate ac across the domestic scene in the US, recognizing that the right is going to attack Biden for anything that happens in relationship to Iran, because they've been agitating for years around Iran, around invading and bombing and going to war with Iran. Since the beginning of this war, we've seen the American right do this, right? Calling for an actual full-scale war with Iran. Uh, and so I think for Iran, what we've seen is restraint and an understanding of the Israelis' attempts to provoke in order to uh, escape the situation they find themselves in in Gaza. And in Iran, it specifically has done a number of different things that I think is further agitating and creating pressure. And I think the U.S. is understanding this. And I believe that the recent developments where the U.S. takes over negotiations, where they um, are cr placing further pressure, where they're calling for an expansion of the mandates for the negotiators, this is all tied to Iran. Now, of course, the domestic pressure factors in, but a regional war that now Iran has justification for, right? It's not that they're attacking the Israelis purely because they um, are set on opposing their, their interests in the region or their, stra or their genocide of the Palestinians. Now they've given them a reason to go to war. And I think legally and internationally, it would be a just war, uh, so to speak. And so I think this is what uh, the Americans most fear. Now, one of the things that we've heard, and I don't know whether it's rumor or true or circulated purely in Arab media, but it's creating added pressure, where the Amer where the Iranians have communicated through uh, mediators and allocators that they're willing 
to not respond to what the Israelis have done vis-a-vis -vis their embassy if an immediate and permanent ceasefire is reached in Gaza. And so this demonstrates, despite the fact that for any nation, for any country, a violation of sovereignty on this level requires a military response. And I'm sure within Iran itself, there are there's pressure and calls for that to occur. It demonstrates Iran's willingness to recognize that the Israelis are desperate and not to give them a way out by um, placing it within the context of the Gaza Strip. You're attacking us because you don't want a ceasefire. And so a ceasefire comes and we don't retaliate. And the Americans, I'm sure, are looking for a way to impose that on the Israelis because they fear mostly a, a, a regional escalation uh, where I believe so many of different forces in the region will be enlisted. And also we'll see the entry of new arenas uh, like Jordan, where there have been unending protests for days uh, and increased pressure on the Jordanian monarchy around the Israelis. Where in Turkey, we see recent municipal elections where Erdogan has lost those elections, his party specifically because of the relate the, the, their position on the Gaza war, their continued trade. We've seen them withdraw over 40 experts, including military and various other important uh, uh, asp aspects of trade for the Israelis. And so this is what we're seeing. The pressure is bubbling everywhere. And this was meant to be the straw that broke the camel's back, but it's still intact. And I think the Americans understand that they need to bring this war to an end if it's going to not result in a regional escalation. Where this is a real pressure cooker. I mean, when you think about what's going on inside of Iran, Iran is a big country, you know, bigger than France. Um, it's got 90 million plus people. It's got a very formidable military. It has allies, armed allies in Syria. It has armed allies in Iraq and in Lebanon. It's a formidable regional force. Uh, and to be subjected to the Zionist assault on your embassy and killing top generals, you know, just four years after Trump ordered the execution of General Soleimani in early January 2020 at the Baghdad airport when he came for peace talks. Uh, they just blew him away at the airport. I mean, there's got to be immense pressure in Iran to do something, respond. And Iran has a lot of capability. I mean, if, if one thinks back to 2020, the, the Iranians had a measured but very significant military response to the killing of General Soleimani. Uh, more than 15 U.S. military bases were targeted with missiles, and they hit their targets. They weren't, the U.S. wasn't able to defend against them. And, uh, and that, after the Iranians did that in retaliation for the killing of Soleimani, Trump backed down. Trump backed down. The U.S. did not retaliate against the striking of U.S. military bases in Iraq by either Iran or Iranian pro-Iranian forces. So the U.S. knew, hey, regional war, we're, that's, a, that's bad news. So Trump, in spite of all of his hyperbole, backed down. Uh, if there was a war, Mohammed, I mean, Iran can strike m many, many targets in Israel. I mean, it has huge capability. The, the Israelis have nuclear weapons, and Iran doesn't. But that aside, the conventional weapon capacity of Iran is quite profound. This is a real pressure cooker. Uh, Netanyahu is playing with fire. Uh, and you would think there would be even more outrage in the United States, given the consequences, not just for Americans, but even for U.S. imperialism in terms of its standing and status in this very, very important region. Yeah, you would think, but I think there's a, a strong element on the right within the U.S. that is eager to enter into war because they've never seen a war or come across a war they didn't like, that they didn't mm -hmm. want to fund, that they didn't want to send Americans to die for. And so I think that's part of it. Um, but at the same time, I think... That's why we've seen the Biden administration kick it into high gear to try to bring this war to an end. And just last week, I believe uh, uh, President Biden, uh, in a sit down with Univision, uh, the Spanish channel, talked about imposing a ceasefire on the Israelis of six to eight weeks unilaterally, not as part of a negotiated uh, uh, arrangement around hostages. 
And so it's clear there's a lot of desperation here. And I think what the Americans are trying to do are trying to balance the domestic political theater, right? Especially from the right. I think obviously they're feeling the pressure from the left and from the pro-Palestine movement in the US, but they're also having to contend with the fact that there's a right that's constantly agitating around Iran and, and the role of the US. And now we've started to see, oh, is the US is abandoning Israel. The US is handing Israel uh, a defeat, which actually should tell you how weak Israel is without the US, right? Um, but in any case, I think uh, the US understands that their priorities right now aren't a war with Iran, that a war with Iran won't achieve any strategic goals for it, and that Israel itself would not just come under attack from Iran, but from the entire region, from Lebanon. Lebanon alone entering the scene, uh, entering the fray would be devastating for Israel. Imagine the entire region, which would require the U.S. to enter. It could not sit on the sidelines. And I think we previously discussed this weeks ago when we talked about the region being a, a pressure cooker, that the popular masses, the people of the region, if this war breaks out, they're going to take a stand. And it's not going to be one in favor of the monarchies that support imperialism. And it's not going to be the reactionary regimes in the region that benefit from it. It's going to be the opposite. And that's a problem not just for the U.S. and Israel. That's a problem for the entire region. Uh, and the U.S.'s long-term strategy, as you mentioned, around imperialism in the region. Yeah, revolutions are very rare in history, Mohammed. And uh, after they happen, people look back and say, well, that revolution was inevitable when you think about X, Y, and Z uh, pre-existing conditions. Before, before the revolution people think it's impossible to make revolution. It's, it it kind of always happens the same way. So you had the French Revolution or the Haitian Revolution, you know, the, the revolution, the Bolivarian Revolution for independence in Latin America, the revolutions of 1830, 1848, the Paris Commune, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese, well, the Chinese Revolution people could kind of see coming. But everything else, it was kind of like these sudden turns triggering events, long pent up frustrations, contradictions within the ruling class, a paralysis within the ruling class that has the preponderance of force on its side but becomes less effective in the application of force because of internal contradictions. All of those ingredients are actually there in the Middle East. I mean, there's the element of leadership, which is also the subjective factor, which is very important for revolution. But you could see even in the Arab Spring in 2011, I mean, uh, however that, you know, and we can discuss how that ended up because of, in some ways, because of the absence of a left leadership. But the power of the masses under certain circumstances becomes the dominant factor. And people generally discount that ahead of time. They generally think, oh, the masses are too busy, too busy with surviving, you know, too sort of apathetic in some cases. But then you look at Jordan in the last, what you mentioned in the last couple of weeks, last days, the whole thing is, it wouldn't just be against the Zionist regime or US imperialism, all of those uh, reactionary regimes in the Middle East, that they could pop. Right, they can. And they're extremely vulnerable because the Palestinian struggle is a unifying one. It is understood to be a compass. It is what brings every single person in the region together. And if you position yourself in opposition to the Palestinian struggle, then you are viewed as an enemy for the masses of the region. And I think what's important to understand is that these moments, this moment we've seen is also giving people an opportunity to push boundaries, to raise the political ceiling. It's giving people a sense of courage, understanding that they actually do have power in the face of these repressive regimes. And there's a compass that exists not on just a like abstract level that Palestine is our compass, that our struggle is so significant to the Arab masses and in, in, in the Muslim uh, ummah, but there's articulated politics around it, right? That's coming from the Palestinian resistance in Gaza. They are speaking to Abu Ubaidah, who's the spokesperson for the Palestinian uh, resistance, uh, military wing of Hamas, routinely speaks to specifically the Jordanian masses and calls on them to go into the streets and to mobilize uh, against the, the presence of the Israeli consulate inside of Jordanian land and against the US uh, embassy in Jordan. 
And so what we're seeing is this is a response to leadership. This is a response to a call to action. And we're seeing Jordanians call on Egyptians, on Moroccans, on Tunisians. There's now a dialogue that's taking place through slogans across the entire region, telling people to revolt against uh, the project of normalization in the region. And all it takes is one spark, one event, like we saw with the Arab Spring, as you mentioned, which was sparked for many, it's attributed to an act of self-immolation, something as obviously grand as that, but also as small as that, right? One individual, uh, uh, a food vendor who was humiliated and saw no other recourse in Tunisia sparked the Arab Spring across the entire region. And so this is what I mean by like the, the, the pressure cooker that you described, that it can go off at any moment is because the conditions exist, they're right for it. There is a political leadership that's targeting specifically U.S. imperialism and uh, Zionist settler colonialism in the region. There's a recognition that the current regimes are either impotent, weak, or in collaboration with this project for normalization and for uh, destruction of the Palestinian cause. And so all of these things coupled together, this perfect storm, can ignite something. And I think everyone recognizes that. And even you know, as we see scenes of the repression that have taken place in Jordan, we've also seen that they've been pushed back against. So they beat up protesters. There was such a mass reaction to what happened to the protesters. And they've now decided to retreat. They've effectively made the Jordanian military police retreat. And so this is what we're seeing. Now, whether this actually transforms into something greater than this, whether it changes the, the future of our region, it's, it's still difficult to say. Um, as you said, rev revolutions are, are unpredictable until they happen. And then everyone saw it coming, right? And so I don't know if, if that's the case here, but uh, I think time will tell. And I, don't, I, I believe the worst case scenario is a regional war that might be that spark for the US. Um, one of the noticeable, observable elements of this unfolding saga, this drama, this war inside the U.S. is as the, the U.S. ally Israel does not succeed militarily, but does succeed in presenting to the world a vivid image that it's a genocidal monster backed by the United States with weapons paid for by the United States, and even the other day when, when you know, the U.S. government officials said, you know, we have to get to a ceasefire and there has to be more aid. And Blink and Biden said, Netanyahu is doing exactly what I told him to do. The reality is that the next arms shipment with thousands more bombs was on its way that day because Obama, uh, back during the Obama administration, and Netanyahu was ripping Obama, spoke before both houses of Congress, denounced the sitting president of the United States' primary foreign policy objective, which was the Iran nuclear arms deal, Netanyahu ripped it. And afterwards, Obama rewarded him with a 10-year, a, a $30, year, $30 billion additional military package. So the next installment was coming the very day that Biden was saying, no, I put my foot down. We're going we're gonna to have a ceasefire. We're going to get more aid to those poor Palestinians and yet they're sending them more and more bombs that they, I mean, the obvious, you know, sort of, and now revealed contradictions are observable by many, many people who in the past either weren't paying attention, didn't know about Palestine, couldn't have put any of that on the map. People are paying attention now because they're in the streets. They've been going to protests. They're really paying attention. I'm talking to young people all over the place and, you know, they are alert and you know, have a lot of clarity about what's going on. But then, then there's this broader part of the population, which is also for the first time being introduced to anti-Israeli ideas and reacting positively to them. And partly it's because of the mainstream media has changed its tune a little bit, and partly because the Biden administration officials have also changed their tune a little bit. And in my mind, that's very reminiscent and I can remember it vividly in 1968, 69, 1970, how the U.S. media reflecting this division within the U.S. ruling class about the conduct of the war in Vietnam started to show the war. And once they showed the war and they showed indecision and Walter Cronkite 
on CBS News, who was kind of like the father of all journalists and spoke in a fatherly way every night to the American people, said about Vietnam, look, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And that, that, this, that larger part of the population that was not involved started to get involved. So the anti-war sentiment starts to have this multiplier impact. And at least in the modern era, Mohammed, public opinion isn't uh, discountable. I mean, public officials, even in a great empire, have to take it into account. Uh, there are disruptions everywhere. Nancy Pelosi, uh, when she speaks, and when she spoke a couple days ago, she was disrupted. One of my friends, comrades, uh, disrupted Hillary Clinton. Uh, these are these politicians can't go anywhere, and you know it's really becoming impactful on American politics. Go ahead. Absolutely. And I think this is the culmination of uh, emerging, different emerging currents within our, uh, the American uh, context within American society. And I think um, it allows us to sort of advance a politics that for some of it corrects some of the flaws and the problematic aspects of the emerging currents and for others strengthens and advances them. And, and here I mean, uh, we have the Occupy movement. Uh, that emerged in the early 2010s that was specifically highlighting uh, the crises, the economic crises, and the role of banks, the role of Wall Street, the role of war profiteers, and the conditions of everyday Americans, our inability to have basic needs met. We can see that contrast happening too with the money being sent for, for Israel compared to the investment in public infrastructure and healthcare and public action in this country. Another thing is the endless war. That is, uh, there are currents within the right and the left in the US, dominant currents around the need to stop funding, supporting, and going to war. And this includes Israel. And we've even seen this more recently with the right that is more skeptical of the establishment, more skeptical of uh, sort of the, the mainstream that emerged as a part of Trump the MAGA movement that is now saying to themselves, wait a minute, there's two things happening here. They want these neocons that still make up the dominant institutional uh, fabric of the American right are calling for more war, calling for funding for war in Ukraine and for Israel, want to go to war with Iran, right? And then there's also this battle around free speech that's happening where we're seeing the Palestinian pro-Palestine movement being repressed, censored, on mainstream platforms, on university campuses and things of that nature. And the right is looking at that saying, this is the right doing that, right? And I'm not saying that these forces of the right, there are ones that we will ever ideologically align with or join in terms of a camp. But what it, look, what, what it means, what it's telling us that on a popular level, on a mass level, across the political spectrum, there are sort of axes that have been cemented over the years that every political force of any relevance, if it wants to agitate, must agitate on. War, money for uh, things unrelated to the basic needs of Americans, censorship and the repression from mainstream establishment, the bankruptcy and the corruption that exists within staple institutions from the intelligence services to the Pentagon to mainstream media, New York Times, just like the headline you shared. This deep cynicism and skepticism is now a popular skepticism and cynicism. And in fact, I believe Trump and the opposite, Bernie, captured that energy, right? And, and drove it in a direction that ultimately was unproductive and actually counter-revolutionary, uh, acted as a counter-insurgency politically. And so, um, now we're picking up the pieces from those movements, and now both the right and the left politically um, are, are, are being exposed on an institutional level. The, and I say left, obviously, we're talking about liberal institutions here, right? But um, so in, 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 in conclusion, I think the U.S. public opinion has shifted because there's been so much work done to shift it, and this is a crystallizing moment this war that's being waged, people can see what they see on their screens. There's no, you know, if, if Vietnam was the most, was the first televised war, I think that's how it was described. Um, this is a war that's been broadcast in a way that no other war has. 
in my opinion. And, and maybe that's because I'm biased from my vantage point. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. But I don't see, I don't think we've seen this day to day documentation from the ground, from various sources, from that completely debunks and dispute things we're hearing from podiums in the White House, right? I don't think I've ever seen that before. Yeah, no, it's it's all different because if you think about Vietnam, just for people who are younger, you know, th there wasn't 24-hour news. There were two or three TV networks. There was ABC, NBC, CBS. The news came on for a half an hour or in some cases one hour a day. There wasn't 24-hour news. There wasn't a Facebook. There wasn't Twitter. There weren't smartphones. There wasn't the ability to instantly have access to information and see something in real time like what we're witnessing with the genocide in Gaza. So I agree with you 100 percent. And that's definitely a material factor in the arousal of this great sort of anti-war sentiment. So there's something new. The technology has allowed us to witness a genocide for the first time. And during the Vietnam War, we woke up every morning and looked at the newspaper and the U.S. said they had something called the body count. And we'd read 170 Viet Cong were killed. The next day, 430 Viet Cong were killed. So we were supposed to be happy about the body count. But because we didn't see the, quote, Viet Cong, we didn't see the Vietnamese people, there wasn't the humanity that was expressed. It was just a dry headline. It took a while for people to sort of, sort of think about that as something terrible. And it took you know, several years. Now, this mass movement on Palestine has happened almost immediately. We were all in the streets on October 8th in Times Square. That's when it started, like within 24 hours. Uh, I want to go back, though, to the, the points that you're making about and the points that I was making about the media coverage. It's now the media, because there is a division with the Israeli Zionist current government about the conduct of the war, the U.S. media is starting to show things that would never have been shown before. CNN, I, I think we have a clip here. CNN has um, sort of an inve their own investigation about the flower massacre where hungry people in Gaza were coming together to receive food and the Israelis massacred them. And then the Israelis said, no, it wasn't us. We didn't do it. It was like people were you know, running over each other. It was a stampede. Well, now CNN, I, let's bring the clip up. CNN says, no, we investigated. It's it's what the Palestinians said. It was a it was a massacre. It's early morning on February 29th on Al Rashid Road in northern Gaza. Thousands of starving people have gathered here to receive food, but as the aid trucks arrive, this happens. The night would become known as the Flower Massacre. By morning, over a hundred would be dead in one of the single biggest mass casualty events of this conflict. All right, so, Mohammed, they weren't showing this kind of stuff before. There's, that's CNN. That's not somebody's social media account. That's not somebody's X or Twitter account. That's CNN. Uh, here's Anthony Blinken talking about the fate of Palestinians in Gaza who are, quote, starving, but they're not just starving, they're being starved by the Israelis. Here's Anthony Blinken, who was the biggest cheerleader for the Israelis. Let's listen. According to the most uh, respected measure of these things, 100% of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of acute food insecurity. That's the first time an entire population has been so classified. Um, we also see, again, uh, according to, in this case, the United Nations, 100% the totality of the population is in need of humanitarian assistance. Yeah, again, for Americans who, you know, aren't reading books for the most part, maybe not doing deep dives about the news on Palestine, this stuff starts to accumulate and have an impact on public consciousness. It's not that CNN became pro-Palestinian, certainly not that Anthony Blinken became pro-Palestinian or anti-Israeli, their consciousness is the same. These are imperialist institutions and imperialist politic politicians, but the messaging has shifted, and that does impact public opinion. Go ahead. Absolutely. And I think it's, um, 
uh, like you said, it's it's due to the pressure that that's been placed on these institutions, the unending mass mobilizations, the disruptions, the sit-ins, the strikes, everything that's taken place over the last six months that obviously has not been enough to end this war because ultimately, you know, the pressure that we're able to place on this government in comparison to its national security interest in seeing the defeat of the Palestinian resistance and the victory of the Israelis pales. But at the same time, our ability to place this pressure is demonstrating that we've grown as a movement. We've enlisted so many more into our ranks. We've become popular in the sense that more people know the details, the intimate details of Palestinian struggle. Right? Like, say, for example, we take the situation with Walid Dhaka, who was a Palestinian political prisoner serving a 37-year prison sentence and uh, was set to be released just uh, a, a year ago. But was his his prison sentence was ex, uh, extinct, uh, extended. He's now been martyred in Israeli prisons, succumbing to uh, illness that he's had, uh, specifically a bone marrow uh, cancer that was medically neglected by the Israelis. Now people know the name of Walid Dhaka. I remember when we organized the protest or uh, in support of him. This was just last year, where we had very few people out in the streets. And now Walid Dhaka is being held as an example of the brutality and the cruelty of the Israelis towards Palestinian prisoners. And I think what we're also seeing, just to note, it, note this, because I think the media's shift is not a shift towards pro-Palestine as you've identified, but I think a shift to an off-ramp narrative that might save the project of US imperialist support for Zionism. We've seen now an attempt to sort of narrow the problem in, and this is in parallel with an attempt domestically within the Israeli political scene to narrow the problem to Netanyahu in the far right, to say, look what Netanyahu has done in terms of the war. Look what Netanyahu in the far right has created as far as uh, the political brutality in that this is, once we excise this minute problem, this small figure, right, where they diminish his, his, his stature but and his role within Israeli society while also placing all the blame on him, this attempt is meant to salvage the, the Zionist project, to say, actually, what's happening here is an aberration after you've seen it and we've been unable to launder it and to whitewash it because we haven't been able to do this. Actually, all the problems that you see are related to him. And recently, I want to say it was Joe Scarborough. Uh, I want to say on MSNBC, if I remember correctly, he had this interview with Nir Barakat, who's a spokesperson for the Israeli military. Uh, or the Israeli government, also a partner of the the, the Netanyahu government, um, where he was pressed not about the massacres they're carrying out, not about the, the forced starvation of millions of people, not about the complete destruction of the Gaza Strip, but about the fact that Netanyahu, through Qatar, called for the funding of Hamas and the Gaza Strip as a way to weaken the prospects of a two-state solution. So why are we talking about this six months into this war? Because it's clear there's an attempt, a concerted effort. We're seeing this from Chuck Schumer to Nancy Pelosi to the Biden administration to Blinken and what we're hearing to attempt to scapegoat Netanyahu. They've made a calculation that this is who we're going to place blame on and what's going to allow us to say, well, now we're bringing in another regime with Benny Gantz or whoever it might be in order to now advance two states or advance a Jewish democratic state in Israel alongside a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. It won't work. Ultimately, I think what's been seared into our consciousness as a people, whether Palestinians or not, is our understanding of the true nature of the relationship between the US and Israel, between what imperialism demands of its satellite states, of its proxy states, and what is required for it to maintain its hegemony in this region. And so either we oppose that in its totality, regardless of how it shows its teeth, or we've made huge setbacks in this moment. And I think, I, I lean that we, we are moving towards the former. Oh, indeed, indeed. I, I mean, and just so everyone gets it, you know, the U.S. always uh, pledges fidelity to its puppet or its proxy until they're no longer necessary or until the time that they have become a liability. And then the U.S., and this is routine in U.S., contemporary U.S. history, the U.S. casts them off 
and actually acts like they were the opponents of that same figure. So when Marcos in the Philippines, the Marcos dictatorship, elicited the, a, a mass people's revolution and the U.S. decided that Ferdinand Marcos was uh, you know, a liability, they got rid of him. They said, well, look, we're part of the anti-Marcos fight for democracy. When baby Doc Duvalier uh, created <coughs> mass protests in Haiti and revolutionary situation, the U.S. who had supported and financed the Duvalier dictatorship in Haiti, they drove him to the airport so he could go into exile. They literally drove him. And they said, see, we helped get rid of Duvalier. They can get rid of Netanyahu, but they're not going to break their ties with Israel because Israel is, Mohammed, from my point of view, it, it, the Zionists have their own narrow interests, which are expansionist interests in the region. But the U.S. has a global perspective and puts the Middle East or West Asia into the perspective of a global strategy for an empire, which the United States obviously is, even though it doesn't call itself that, like the old empires proudly did. But the U.S. isn't going to let Israel go because it's an extension of American military power in a region that could have a revolution uh, easily. And so it's like an attack dog against progressive forces. It's a policeman. It's a gendarme uh, for the Pentagon. So they're not going to let go. So I, I think it's really important for people to recognize that this distancing from Netanyahu is damage control. It's not pro-Palestinian. But that said, it still is an indicator that things are moving in the right direction. You know, they, Blinken wouldn't be talking about hunger in Gaza if they thought they were about to win. Uh, they'd be like celebrating. They would get on the aircraft carrier and say, mission accomplished, like Bush did after three weeks in Iraq. Anyway, when we look at the big picture here, um, the historical struggle for justice for Palestine is gaining more and more adherence. Inside of Israel, and I want to, as we're kind of getting to the finish line, I want to read to you from, it's, a, it's an article that came out earlier from Al-Akbar uh, Media, and it quotes, the former head of Mossad's Prisoners and Missing Persons Department, Rami Igra, warned in an interview with Radio 103 FM yesterday that, quote, Israel's situation is deteriorating, that a prisoner exchange deal will not be reached. The reason for this is the refusal of the Israeli government and its president, Netanyahu, to hold deliberations about the future of Gaza. Uh, and then he talks about how all of the announced plans to invade Rafa, to dominate and crush Hamas, all of it is just not true. None of it is realized. It's a sense of great despair. Uh, when you think, well, U.S. imperialism, if, if it loses a battle, you know, that, that's got a lot of resilient power. But for Israeli society, and so many people in Israel have a second passport, I mean, it must feel like the situation, in spite of what the right wing says, that the situation is becoming sort of significantly deteriorated given the fact that Israel has become a global pariah and that's not going to shift. Again, I want to ask you, we've talked about this in the past, but as we get to the finish line, what does it mean for the Zionist project, you know, right now and in the coming years? Obviously, Israel is not going to vanish tomorrow. There's not going to be a liberated Palestine from the river to the sea tomorrow. But let's talk about where the Zionist project goes because if you're, a, if you're a project that relies mainly or almost exclusively on military power and endless war, at a certain point, that doesn't work. Yes, um, I think, you know, there's a famous saying that Israel is a military with a state, not a state with a military. And I think this sort of really fully captures the character of this uh, entity that exists from the river to the sea as we speak. And I think it's really hard to predict where this goes because the contradictions internal to Israeli society and then externally, which are compounding the internal contradiction, it's hard to say how they'll be resolved. On the one hand, you're absolutely right. 
there's no way for them to regain their position through military means. And those are the only means at their disposal. And so what does it look like then for them to potentially negotiate something? And who are they negotiating with? And on what terms are they negotiating, right? Because you can solve your problems with the Gaza Strip in relationship to a ceasefire in this moment, but that doesn't solve the North and Lebanon. That doesn't solve the Gazan uh, enclave, the uh, or sorry, the, the perimeter of Gaza and the settlements that existed around there. That doesn't solve the West Bank and the ranking up of tensions and the increased confrontations with the Israeli military. They've expended so much money political capital on an international level. As you said, they're a pariah state effectively. Uh, their economy is in shambles. They've mobilized their full human capital, the full force of reservists. Their entire economy was sort of geared towards prosecuting this war. And they've been unable to achieve a single military objective and have no plans for the day after, so to speak, as though they could impose their plans, as though just having plans means that it's done, right? So it's a situation that is extremely uh, dire for them. Domestically, there's increased tension between the more religious elements that refuse to serve in the military, and the secular elements within Israeli society who recognize that the toll, the human cost that they've ex expended on prosecuting this war, one, wasn't enough and requires them to actually bring in more people into it. And those people are refusing to be brought into it for their own sort of narrow religious um, sort of aspirations. And so effect, there's really, really difficult to see a way out. Now, if you listen to some of the Israeli politicians that exist outside of the current coalition or are sort of prior leaders like Ahud Barak, former Mossad directors, some of the people that are quoted in this Al-Akhbar article and quoted elsewhere, I think referenced in the Haaretz article, they tell you, we knew this was coming. They call on the PA to assume control of, of the Gaza Strip or a coalitional Arab coalitional force, right? They understand that really there was nothing that they were going to be able to do militarily. Now, they still say they support the war because they have to say that. They still say they support the, the efforts made by the Israelis, the cutting off of, of all food, water, electricity, and fuel. They, they tell you they, are, they defend every strike in every... Uh, building destroyed and every person killed in the Gaza Strip because that's their politics. It just they say maybe we should have had a different strategy or maybe we should have thought about this or that. But ultimately, I don't think they have answers either. I think the full spectrum of Israeli politics, in, coupled with the contradictions within them, is incapable of resolving the contradictions facing the Israeli state, are incapable of confronting the position they found themselves in by invading Gaza, by besieging Gaza for 16 years, by subjugating the Palestinians. They want their cake and, and they want to eat it too. And it's not going to work. And they're now realizing it. The question is, um, you know, where do they go from here? What are they able to salvage? That's very difficult to say. And uh, I think you know, as with our previous conversations, when we talked about w with revolutions, you see the conditions there. I see the conditions for a lot of things to happen in Israel. I just don't know what that means in terms of it, its actual occurrence. All right. We're going to keep following the story, Mohammed. Uh, we want people to also check out the Palestinian Youth Movement uh, website and social media. I think it's PalestinianYouthMovement.org. I is that dot correct? Com. Dot, com. dot com. Palestinian Youth yes. Movement dot com. We can put it up on the screen as well. Uh, there's going to be a major conference to bring together different sectors within the Palestinian movement and the Palestinian support movement uh, coming up in Detroit uh, the weekend of May 24th to the 26th. Uh, there's constant activity everywhere. It's not going to stop. It's going to intensify. Uh, Mohammed, I want to thank you once again for joining the Socialist Program. Thank you for having me, as always.